What is play and how do we understand it as a tool for connecting with and creating trust with our PDA children and teens? Today I have a dear friend and developmental play therapist who works through the DIR floor time lens, Lauren Stern Noel. She's with us for our second podcast slash YouTube video together and we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of play with PDA kids who sometimes play in ways that look different than us, like as parents have imagined play. Like for example, I always thought, oh, I'll do puzzles, I'll throw a ball back and forth, I'll read with my kid. And for my son Cooper, my PDA son who's now nine, that has looked very different than my expectations. And Lauren is actually the person in my life who started me on my learning about play journey through a very different lens. So without further ado, welcome Lauren. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I'm excited. Okay, so to kick us off, I want to tell a brief story about how I started playing with Cooper. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about okay. <laughs> your experience and tips for parents who are wanting to deepen playing connection. Okay, so I learned about a floor time or play lens through Lauren um, about four and a half years ago. And at the time, my PDA son Cooper was almost five and really didn't have any imaginary play skills, or at least that's what appeared to me. Like I didn't know how to engage with him. And even since he was a young infant, when I would try and introduce toys, he just didn't really do anything with them or interact with them or he would destroy them. Like, you know, I would try and build something and he'd just break it down. Or if I tried to like engage with stuffed animals, he would just, you know, reject it or start crying. And so I really didn't know what to do. So one of the first places I went was the Perfectum Institute, which you suggested, which is a website where you can see some modules for training parents. And one of the videos was of a dad with a very young autistic child who was climbing in and out of the crib of the child and seeing the child's face light up for the first time because he was engaging in and, and initiating play. And so my husband and I actually copied that idea because my son, even though he was five, had his old crib in the room. And we were very stressed at the time, so we didn't feel a lot of creative juices flowing. So we're like, let's try climbing in and out of the crib. And, you know, non-verbally goofing around, pretending like we couldn't get in, my husband's climbing in there, this big guy and like rolling around in the crib and Cooper came over and put his little foot between the bars, but didn't have the motor skills to climb. And so my husband picked him up and they were both in the crib. And that was like really the first time that we had any sort of reciprocal play. And from that point on, at least for two years, my husband and I each dedicated, one of us dedicated an hour of play a day with Cooper, mostly me in the beginning. And in the beginning, it often just looked like for a whole hour, him jumping on his bed and me throwing stuffies at him. And I was like, this doesn't really feel like play. But then some themes emerged, right? Like learning to be a baby, and then a toddler, like I would change his pretend diapers, I would bottle feed him, we would have a snack, we would both nap for two seconds, and I'd want to fall asleep. And then we would get in the crib and then do it again, like just rotating. Um, but for me, because my son was in burnout, and because he was not communicating in spoken ways, and whenever I tried to talk to him, he would growl, or say stop talking play was really sort of the portal for us to get connection um, and rebuild trust after I had, you know, activated his threat response quite a bit by traditional parenting. So 
Um, that has been, in a nutshell, our relationship with play, thanks to you as the like catalyst. Um, but since this is your specialty, I would just love to hear how you would even think about or understand what play is. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I, yeah, I love the example that you gave where the themes were emerging, because what Cooper did was brilliant. He went back to earlier stages in development when he wasn't feeling so connected or he wasn't available. And it wasn't anything that you and your husband were doing or not doing. It was his profile. And um, I remember when he was a baby, he was, a, would you have described him as a fussier baby? Um, so he just wasn't available for that connection. And when we think about connection with infants, it is just this reciprocity of nonverbal signaling and responding. And so he brilliantly went back to that stage to sort of fill in that gap in his development. And then when he felt like, you know, you and he had really established that, he went up to the next level where, you, you know, maybe it was playing around with some toddler two behaviors or being a little naughty. Um, so I like that example you gave because it really illustrates how powerful play can be in repair, right? Yeah. He, he wanted to repair with you and he needed that nurturing that he wasn't really available for, not for lack of trying, right? Yeah. Um, so this question is, is so complex. What is play? Because it is so many things. But I think, especially in thinking about children with developmental differences and regulatory challenges and a PDA type profile, it's really about connection. Um, and, and trust and it's not about teaching it's not about learning it's not about academics it's about staying connected and when you think of children with regulatory challenges you think of a need to co-regulate you cannot co-regulate if there's no relationship so you casey and cooper used play to strengthen your relationship so then you could then co-regulate with him mm -hmm. right and he was feeling more comfortable in the world and exploring his world because you went back and you established that trust, right? Following, I, I heard you say you followed his lead. You didn't try to rush him from when he was being a baby to when he was pretending to be a toddler. You stayed at his level and his pace. So play, I think, most importantly for children with developmental differences is about integration. It's an opportunity for them to integrate their personal experiences, what they're learning about the world, um, and they have to use their visual system, their motor system, their language system. So you might have a child who in a very structured setting, can sit at a table and access language and have a conversation. But when it comes to integrating language with movement and another person um, and symbolic themes, they might not have that same capacity to communicate. Um, and so you have to think about what level of play should we be at so that all the systems can kind of work together. Right. So it, it's really a, an opportunity for children to sequence their ideas. Um, certainly from the mental health perspective, we really like to emphasize that um, children process their feelings through play and they can manage the anxiety that they feel in the world through play. They practice regulation through play. Yeah. Yeah. And a theme I know from my work with hundreds of families with PDA children is that there's some interesting themes that organically seem to emerge that are consistent. So like my son started with like him as an infant, but there's also a lot of um, anecdotes about like relearning to walk or relearning to eat or the child wanting to be a baby puppy, a baby polar bear, a baby alligator, and then the parent is or like an orphaned animal, and then the parent is the 
you know, mama polar bear. So we also, after about a year of the initial play, went through a stage up until probably about like even six months ago, like on the weekends, he would sometimes be like, can we play baby puppy? And he would pretend to be an orphaned puppy and I would find him in the cave. So, you know, four years, there were about Mm -hmm. two and a half of them, three of them that were strongly, like that was the baseline theme was Mm -hmm. the orphaned or baby animal that needed to be found and taken care of. Right, yeah, that's about nurturing right? Nurture me, take care of me. Even if I'm pushing you away or I was pushing you away, I still need you. I still need the connection. I still need you to nurture me and take care of me. Um, It's about separation sometimes too. Um, Feeling okay in the world when my primary co-regulator isn't with me. Um, So playing around themes of separation, hide and seek, you know, even peekaboo, I, I play peekaboo with some older children on a, yeah. a bit of a more sophisticated level, um, but it's it's just that sort of reassurance that you go away, you come back, you take care of me, you can hold me in your mind even if I'm not with you. This sort of hiding things and finding things is a theme sort of along those lines. So even children who might not be able to do it so symbolically like Cooper did, they might hide a toy in the ball pit or the sand table and find it. Uh, mommy, go find it. Uh, so it's the theme is the same. It just depends on the child's kind of developmental capacities. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other another theme, like especially in the occupational therapy space. Um, hide and go seek. Floor is lava. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Peekaboo and hiding, like even though my son's eight right? Um, Which I had associated with like infancy or young children, Mm -hmm. right? But the themes have continued in a way that like at points as a parent, I was like, is he not developing? Like, why is he playing these sort of remedial games? Mm -hmm. Now I understand it more like how you're saying it's like practice, practice with those themes and that anxiety for the for the real world outside of the play scenario. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Awesome. So let's get into the nitty gritty and the tips and like the how to, because parents will be hungry for this. Um, So you've worked with, with PDA profiles, you've worked with all different types of neurotypes and learning disabilities and differences. So one of the themes for parents of PDAers, PDA children, is avoiding engagement, <laughs> right? Not wanting to play, not wanting to engage, rejecting bids for that initial connection. So um, have you experienced this in your therapy work? What does it look like? And sort of how do you manage it practically in the sessions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. It does happen a lot. Um, I'm remembering when I was working with a child with um, pretty classic autism, and he was maybe three or four at the time. This was a long time ago, and he was very withdrawn. um, And it was very hard to get him to connect or to sort of notice my presence, right? Um, So we started in a small room where he couldn't escape. Um, And there was a mirror on one wall and there were a couple just kind of mats and soft kind of crashing things. Um, And I just, we started with him tolerating me being in his space. I'd be in the corner, I'd be away. Um, I wasn't using language at all. Um, If he vocalized, I might imitate his vocalization And then he'd sort of orient to me and notice, oh, there's some lady here with me. Um, He was very into the mirror. So he would go to the mirror and he'd stare at himself and I'd go behind him. And just so I could sort of be in his field of vision, but it didn't feel so invasive to him. And that's actually how we started our, our connection and how he began to tolerate being in the space with me. And very quickly from there, actually, uh, his 
our connection grew and he, we ultimately got to this really fun reciprocal place where, you know, I'm throwing a ball and he's going to get the ball. Um, so it, it's hard, I think, especially for parents, because sometimes we have to start so low and so slow. And as parents, we are pressured, pressuring ourselves sometimes to hurry kids along, to help them get skills. They're going to be behind. They're going to need help in school. They need to learn. They need to grow. But they cannot do that if they're not in their thinking brain. And so what we're doing is we're helping them emerge from this kind of fight or flight or a the blue pathway, which is kind of just withdrawn and isolated um, to a, a green pathway, which is kind of connected and available to learn and to engage. So that's sort of my key tip, even though it's very hard to do is it's okay to be go all the way down the developmental ladder. It's okay to be slow. If you rush it, it's a little counterproductive, right? Because kids aren't going to hold on to skills. They're not integrated if they're not in the higher level kind of of the brain. Yeah, they're not in the frontal lobe. Like that. Yeah, so I think I love these key points, and they do tie back to our first part of the conversation, which is just even if on other dimensions the child looks completely typical in a lot of ways like my son did in the play area and the sensory area and the self-regulation area he in some ways and actually his preschool teacher when we still lived in dc said she always knew which cry was cooper's because it sounded like an infant mm -hmm. right so his on a certain dimension we really had to go back mm -hmm. to very basic interactions right mm -hmm. nonverbal and spent i mean i hope this isn't disheartening to parents but it took us years mm -hmm. right like it took us a really long time of being consistent with this to actually get to that um more reciprocity trust and connection but second there was absolutely no learning intention of like i'm going to teach him this skill I'm going to teach him how to do X. There's a agenda behind the play other than connection. Mm -hmm. Because with a PDA or that perception can actually set off the threat response and get in the way of the of the intent. Right, right. And by going all the way back with Cooper and spending years, look at all the things he can do now, right, is there really was an amazing benefit to that because you went back and you helped him fill in the gaps. And now, you know, when he is regulated and in his highest capacities, he's doing all these amazing things, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other piece to that, I think, is it's so hard to um, let the child control the play, right? Yeah. Um, that was my to let the tower, let them build the tower and let it not try to fix it, you know, let it fall and then go through kind of the, the feelings of that, right. For the child, as opposed to kind of preventing that from happening or the creativity, um, letting it happen and not trying to guide, um, you know, that this, this tower should look like this, or this artwork should look like this. It's really, sometimes parents need to let go of the product and just stay in the process. And I, I know that that's hard because we're operating from an adult brain. So, yeah, you know, for us to go all the way back is, is hard. Yeah, no, I mean, I find that even with my younger son, William, when we're building, I'm like, Oh, but you should put it there. And then I'm like, Casey, come on, like, stop. I have to reapply the lens. Yeah. Um, so what is it like what do we do so i can share what i do but like you i don't work directly with kids right like mm -hmm. i work with parents and mm -hmm. i do play with my own children but since you have so much experience with working with so many children like when the when the controlling or the correcting of you comes mm -hmm. into play and this is an experience that a lot of parents of PDA children have of like, you know, any move they make, the kid is saying it's wrong, or 
you know, they're doing something, but it's incorrect. And it's like, almost like the play itself is just controlling the parent. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips, ideas or perspectives on like, and examples of what you do in a, in a situation where a child is just wanting to control you? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I have to go into each session sort of in the right mental space, right? Um, and I, I that's much harder for parents to do, I think, right? And it's not a session for the parents. It's their life, right? It's their everyday yeah. life. Um, and so from a therapeutic perspective, if I am finding myself getting corrected too much, it's sort of a signal to me that I'm doing too much, right? And so I then say to myself, okay, well, they weren't ready for that bid. Um, in the floor time world, we call it a bid for interaction, right? Um, so we kind of float something out there and try not to make it seem like our idea or our intention. Um, and so when I find myself getting rejected too much, it's sort of a message to myself, like you aren't following enough. Um, so I don't know if that helps as sort of a, a tip. Um, and, and I, I have just been okay with it because it's therapy and that's what I'm there for. I think it is harder for parents to let their child control their every idea and movement and what they can say and what they can't say. Um, and a lot of times parents will say, well, how are they going to learn that they can't their whole world can't revolve around them, right? But again, we go back to they're not in their thinking brain and we're not teaching anything. They will absolutely learn that the world doesn't revolve around them when they're in their thinking brain. And when you've established the foundations, when we're working on foundational work, we just can't think all those steps ahead, even though parents are constantly needing to think of the future, we really have to stay in the moment. Um, so sometimes a strategy I'll give for parents is, um, which I think is how you started, Casey, do 10 minutes a day, do 20 minutes a day of just this session where you're in the room or you're in the playroom and you're just following the child's lead and it's it's okay that they overpower the situation. And, and maybe a parent can tolerate it for 10 minutes and then it's going to grow and grow. Yeah, I love that. So one of the things I label this for parents is therapeutic equalizing. So, mm -hmm. you know, the root cause of the perception of threat for PDA kids is when there is a perceived loss of autonomy or control and or the perception that someone like you or I is above them, right? Mm -hmm. And that is subconscious perception, neuroception. Right. And then it sets off their nervous system. And one of the things they try and do to get back to a place of felt safety is they equalize or sometimes control or, you know, sometimes have somewhat aggressive behavior to those that they're most safe with. So. Mm -hmm. I looked at this for a still as a safe container to do that so that it's practice that to allow them to do it in a safe container and lean in as a parent, which is super hard because you have all those thoughts of like, well, if I don't teach them not to do this now, they'll be more likely to do it outside of the home. But it's actually the opposite where they have that opportunity to do the equalizing in a play setting. And then over time, it's less pronounced outside of the play setting, mm -hmm. but it's like a safe container. Like um, my son used to, in the past three years, he loved um, sassy sister where he had like a sassy teenage sister that was like me, my husband or our au pair. And he would then like torment the teenage sister, steal her stuff, destroy her things. Yeah. You know, then I'd have to switch back to mom and her name was Rebecca. I don't know why. And be like, Rebecca, you get to your room. And I'd punish Rebecca. And then, you know, William and Cooper would laugh hysterically. And for a while, like three years ago, it was one of the first spaces where 
my PDA son could be with my other son in a, in a play setting without that type of behavior being directed at William. Mm -hmm. And yes, it took a lot of energy and improv, <laughs> but it was actually kind of hilarious. Like the more we leaned into it that I was like Rebecca and then I'd switch to like <laughs> the mom calling from like the upstairs to be like, Rebecca, you're not going on your date. And then the boys would love it and be like, oh, ah, she, her crush da, da, da. <laughs> so yeah that's great. but that's a more sophisticated expression of it over time right. but I think in the moment parents are just like I can't play because my kid's controlling me mm -hmm. yeah um, but you're you're giving them the space right um and and the opportunity and the that's what play is is it's not about toys or what you're doing necessarily it's you're giving him the space to work through uh what he needs to work through yeah um do you have any other do you have any anecdotes about like a particularly challenging play session when you were being controlled and like what that felt like and what you did yeah I think so I've gone through it as a professional and a parent, and it's much harder on the parent side, right? Yeah. Um, and this happens with neurotypical children too. If they're having a hard day or they want to play something out because they're practicing, they're, they're, they're processing internal experiences, they're processing experiences that happened at school or at the park. And, and so I need to be available for my children to do that as well, right? And I can say it is much harder to do as a parent than in a therapy session where I come into someone's home and I work with their child for an hour and then I leave. Um, and to me, I just have to remember that it's it's the most powerful thing I can be doing for my kid at the moment. And I need to let go of sort of what I need because it's it's for my kid. And it's what my kid needs. And I want my kid to then go out in the world and be able to manage their emotions. And if they have to practice through me, then that's what they need to do. And so I've got, I've got scenarios from both sides, right? And yeah, it's, you know, you can't say this, you can't have your ideas, you can't look where that, you can't be here, you've got to be there. Um, we do a lot of pretend play in, in my house and, um, we would make a grocery store or a library and I just sort of would have to go through every step and I, I just couldn't sh share any ideas. I was sort of the pawn, right? Yeah. And around. And, th and that to me is, is what my kids needed in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Okay, now this is um, a question about like sort of the next level of activation of the okay. child, which might be more than just controlling, but more like, you know, activation or aggression, even mm -hmm. if it's verbal, like more or like throwing things at you, like, mm -hmm. do you experience that in sessions? And how do you, like, what are the nuts and bolts of how you manage that. Yeah. Well, in yes, this comes up a lot. And and I run social groups too. So sometimes I've got four children with unique profiles at once. Um, and I like to establish I like to establish rules, what I'm okay with and what I'm not okay with. And I typically try to have as few rules as possible just to allow for success. When we're talking about safety, of course, that's a rule, right? I have to let go of like messy, destructive, um, maybe negative language, for example. I personally let go of that and don't kind of intervene if, if harsh language is being used. And so I might be in a group play session with kids and I have to modulate it for them, which is they're doing superheroes, they're doing good guy, bad guy, they're doing, you know, hero, villain, 
and I'm pacing it for them so that they don't escalate maybe all the way. Um, we use a lot of pauses. Oh, wait, let's pause. Um, help them reflect on something that happened. If someone has gotten too physical, then um, I'll say, wait, 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 we've got to stop. I do have one rule and it's that we can't hurt each other. Or I have a rule and that it's we can't hurt each other and we can't hurt the, the room or the space or the materials. Um, so whenever possible, I try to not have so many rules, but I do draw a line at safety. And so I might say, you know, we can play that way, but we can't touch each other. So let's practice a way to capture um, the bad guy that's going to feel okay to the bad guy, right? Bad guy, is it okay if we pull you by your hand um, to take you to jail? Uh, yes. And then we sort of negotiate, even if it's so I do the same, even if I'm playing with one child. I could say, you know, I really don't like when people touch my face, but it's okay for me if you pull me by my hand or if you push me towards the jail or whatever. Um, so, so I always go into a session thinking, well, what are my boundaries? What can I let go of? What am I comfortable with? Um, and how do I not shut it down, but sort of reshape it into something else? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I love that the um, the boundary and the I statement. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like to be hit in the face. Yeah. But you can push my body towards the jail. Right. Right. So that's like a lot of what at this stage of the game. Now that my son is more in the thinking brain, more of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, those types of declarative sentence and and redirection. But yeah. I think for a lot of PDA kids, especially in the beginning of their play journey, there's too many perceived losses of autonomy and equality in group play. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that you've found in your work and that the one-on-one -on -one is really the best place to start. Yes, absolutely. And then a dyad is sort of the next step, right? Um, with one other peer um, mm -hmm. that, that can sometimes it's it's um, parents really want a sibling involved, which I know for the PDA profile, it can be really tricky, um, but important also, um, especially for the family unit is is when I go into a home, I can help the family unit by incorporating siblings into the play and helping modulate and control the the dynamic yeah I think like probably for the last two years that's sort of like the intuitive role that my husband and I have played and it's just recent that my son is playing with other kids without us involved like mm -hmm. actually doing the game oh. with them right yeah. so like a lot of times when we would go to parks my husband or I would end up being in the game, to use your word, modulating with other yeah. random kids at the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, we're the weird parent who's like climbing through the play structure. But like, I was doing it because I knew that it could tip over so quickly if there wasn't sort of this buffer. Exactly. And that's really, you know, I think to a large extent where we still are with siblings, where there needs to be a safe nervous system that's aware of thresholds, like sort of in the mix between the siblings while mm -hmm. playing. Mm -hmm. Because when it's just the two of them, it very quickly tips over into not safe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like your point about the park. I actually do a lot of sessions at the park um, because going back to this idea of children integrate while they're playing, um, it's very hard when there's kind of this big motor planning obstacle of all this um, equipment at a park. You've got other kids that probably they don't know, right? Um, so that's very sort of can be um, un unexpected what happens from other kids, right? And we're moving and it's multi-sensory and it's, it's 
really helpful to do play sessions in a more dynamic setting like the park because kids are going to go to the park yeah exactly yeah and I think my mindset was just like well as long as he'll have me and as long as he needs me yeah I'm going to play you know because he will reach the point where <laughs> developmentally he's not going to want me up in the mix <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um and you know sort of reaching that point at nine yeah um Okay, so I want to talk about our last topic, which is so yeah. fundamental, I think. Um, and I just want to frame it with why I'm asking it, which is I think a lot of parents of PDAers are very hungry for um, finding other safe and therapeutic nervous systems to be part of their care team. But mm -hmm. often when they find therapists of any flavor, there's this initial focus on establishing trust and connection. Mm -hmm. and relationship and then and things go well I mean not all the time but you know mm -hmm. there's this mm -hmm. initial like and there's some novelty so that regulates the PDA or as well but then they start to push into skills mm -hmm. and sort of decrease emphasis on trust and then things go off the rails so an example I have often parents I've worked with is like they do parent child interaction therapy and mm -hmm. the kid does swimmingly in the first half, which is like establishing trust and connection. And mm -hmm. then when they go into the skill and behavior part, it's a disaster. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's a common theme of like, OK, well, we trust each other now. Now I'm going to push you. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that PDA kids will reject therapy. Right. Because mm -hmm. they're perceiving an agenda, an expectation, a loss of autonomy, mm -hmm. which is to them perceptually, subconsciously, a lack of trust, like a lack of right. adult safety. Right. So how does this idea factor into your work as a DIR floor time mm -hmm. therapist? And like, how do you view trust and connection with the child you're working with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, one of the things I love about the DIR floor time model is that it's it's very fluid. And so trust and connection isn't something that becomes established and then it's solid, right? It, it, we're always working up and down the developmental ladder, the emotional ladder. And so we sort of have to go into each session holding on to the, the relationship. It's a relationship-based model. It is not a model that is very concrete and teaching explicit skills. It's much more working on the foundations. Um, so if a child is really regulated, really engaged, we're sort of at a high, we're operating at a high level, uh, then we can extend the play a little bit more. We can insert um, a playful obstruction or a little challenge. Um, but that's only if in the moment we are at our highest capacity and we go into each floor time session, um, remembering that regulation and connection is very fluid. It's not something that you attain and then it's there. Um, and so we're always operating around the foundations of learning and growing and connecting and less sort of explicit skills. Yeah. So what would, so two things are coming up for me. One is like the nonlinear nature of development. Mm -hmm. And two is the fluctuating nature of the disability of PDA where like especially with like my son, sometimes in occupational therapy, he'll come in and he'll have all these ideas, you know, he's like into football. So he's setting up, you know, a flag football game in the therapy session and me and the OT are like playing it with him. Whereas sometimes he comes in and he like wants to sit in the hammock swing and just tell us what to do mm -hmm. the whole time. And mm -hmm. it really depends on the day. Yeah. Right? But the overall trajectory, like he just graduated down to one OT session a week after almost five years. Yeah, we started out with like four or five a week, um, but it was play based. Um, mm -hmm. He still has days like that, right? Where it's like, nope, not going to engage in like any any agenda or any skills or even push himself. He's just like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in the hammock swing and eat this lollipop and tell you 
about my day and sort of direct the play. And I view that as therapeutic for his nervous system safety. And just because there's one session or a couple like that in the linear, not linear, but like in the trajectory towards him learning what he wants to learn, Mm -hmm. it's fine. But I think it can be hard for parents like me where I started, which is like, okay, we're going to do 12 sessions and then we're going to fix this. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's fair, right? It, it's hard work and, and parents have to go through the journey of acceptance, right? It's not something that happens overnight. Um, and I have parents that say to me a lot, great. So you did the play thing. When are we going to move on from play and do learning? Um, I have this, this kiddo I'm working with right now. And the mom has said to the team of floor time therapists, you know, he loves the play sessions. He loves the floor time sessions so much. He's having such a hard time at school. So can you incorporate a little bit more structured um, activities or learning in your play session? And we're like, well, that's not play therapy. (laughs) Yeah, let's let's do the opposite. Let's bring some more play into the school setting, but I know you can't control that. (laughs) This this kiddo, I, I went, he so loves when I come to his house. He waits at the window. And one day I went to his house and I could tell he was a little agitated and um, we started playing and something wasn't right, but I, I didn't want to ask a direct question. Right. So I just kind of said, I wonder how your day was. And he said, I will not have a growth mindset. And I was like, okay, buddy, I hear you. I mean, and I was like, you don't have to have a growth mindset, you know, no problem. He'd come home from school. Right. Yeah. And, And I'm cracking up inside because I'm like this, what I can't imagine what this kid told his teacher to do with her growth mindset. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I I felt that before too. Like, come on, man, I don't want to grow right now. I just want to feel my feels. For sure. And like (laughs) your growth mindset is not going to help me when I'm dysregulated in your classroom. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, it's, it's hard for the teacher. It's hard for the family, but this kid is telling them your growth mindset does nothing for me. I can tell you what it means because you've told me and I remember it, but I don't feel it in my body. And when we're playing, that's when the integration happens, right? He's the good guy. And he's actually so sweet, you know, and at school with his growth mindset, he's throwing things right. And at home, he wants to rescue people. He's the hero. He's in charge. He's powerful. He's strong, um, but he's nurturing. And like, if he puts me in jail and I'm hungry, he lets me order a pizza. (laughs) 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 No, that's not a digression. That's a digression. That's a great example. Yeah. So how, I guess, like, maybe this is going back to the beginning, but like, let's say I'm a parent, like I was, I mean, I'm still a parent, but like, my kid is just on an iPad, they don't want to engage with me. And I'm trying to start a play practice with them. Like, what would you coach a parent to start doing? Mm -hmm. Like, because it's not going to work to go to a PDA kid to be like, Hey, do you want to play? Right. Right. (laughs) You know? So like, what would you do in that scenario? What would you recommend a parent try in the most like, like granular words possible? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes just putting something out, is is helpful if you know it's it's a motivating activity uh sensory play so putting out a bin you know with water or um sensory beads you know water beads or sand kinetic sand or play-doh uh sometimes i just sit on the floor and i start playing and i start doing something that looks really fun and enticing and that's a nice principle of the floor time model is like be fun and interesting you know try to lure the child into what you're doing um so so that's something that i that has worked pretty nicely with with children with a pda profile um and even my own son, he'll say his sort of re- reaction initially is like, no, but then when he 
encompasses the activity as his own idea, then he wants to do it, right? Yeah. Um, and so even for him, I, I just put things out and um, developmentally, that's kind of a phase that some kids go through is like, don't tell me what to play. Um, so I think that's a principle that can help sort of across developmental profiles, um, you know, being enticing and, and kind of structuring the environment in a way that is going to sort of be conducive to focused a shared attention around an activity. I like to control the space um, where I'm sort of limiting what's available to kind of hyper-focus on something that I know is really regulating for a child. So I don't have too many options available, um, just one or two. Yeah. Love that. Strewing. A youth Strewing. Crew. We're going to strew. strew. So that's a tactic that I've used quite a bit with my son, where it's like, I'll do something as an offering. Sometimes he gets off his iPad, sometimes he doesn't, but mm -hmm. like it's a visual cue that I'm engaged in something and it's an option. Mm -hmm. Right. But with the energy of like, I'm going to do it regardless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes children open-ended play can feel very overwhelming to them, right? If their yeah. ideation or their ability to kind of ideate, think of an idea and then execute or motor plan, then structured board games are really enticing for children that have limited ideation because the rules are built in. It tells you what to do. Now, of course, I don't want to draw a child to a board game if I know they have really creative um, ideation and ideas, but for some children, that's it's a very safe way to play is through a, a structured activity. So yeah. depending on the profile, that can be helpful too. Yeah. As long as you're okay with not winning or yeah. the adult is okay intentionally not, not winning. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the caveat because often any type of competitive anything right. is or with rules like mm -hmm. a board game can be too much for a PDA kid for the PPA profile yeah. yeah 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 okay this was so fun talking to yeah. you thank you for your practical tips and tools for starting play with a PDA kiddo um and yeah is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience I don't think so thanks for having me yeah thank you so much Lauren we'll talk again soon perfect thanks bye